change, imitate, which had been in a lot of the older versions of the scriptures, uh, to follow. I suspect it become follow because of the way the word imitate has changed over time. And to use imitate of this text would be the only time in the entire Bible that's actually used. That is, it's the only time in the Bible where you're asked to imitate God. Many times you're asked to imitate Jesus, of course. Quite often Paul would say, imitate me as I imitate Jesus. But this is the only text, Ephesians 5.1, where there's a direct command to imitate God. And they've changed it to follow, I think, largely because the way that imitate can be used is much like Jay Farrow in in that first clip. That is, Christians can get in the habit of seeing how other people act and start to mirror or to copy their behaviour. But it does not mean you become that person. It does not mean you've had a change of heart. It's obvious he's an impressionist. And so the idea is that imitation, if it's in a church, can sometimes not reflect a character change. You can imitate someone. You can copy their actions. Now you may think, well, that's not a terrible thing. But when you get to verse 3 and they start talking about all the behaviours, we can get into the misunderstanding that our aim in life is to avoid doing those behaviours. I should copy people who don't do that. And on the converse, I will copy people who do these other behaviours. But it may not lead, or come from, I should say, a change of heart, whilst the text itself is entirely the opposite of that. To follow, as we'll see in a moment, to imitate, is because you have a change of heart. But sometimes that's not how the word is used. When I was in Indonesia, I've said this before, I used to love going and seeing this shop, and I took a photo of it, but I've lost it. I wish I still had it. The shop was called Genuine Fake because it used to sell as close as you could, indistinguishable of EPL, that English Premier League uh, jerseys. And you'd go in there, you could find your uh, so on and so forth. Genuine fakes, so close. And sometimes as Christians, we can be like that. We can copy the behaviour of someone else. And then we get absolutely saddened when that person sins and falls from grace and completely behaves in an inappropriate way. I think for non-Christians, they have that too, but they may think more like the second one. That is, God is the ventriloquist. Well, who was the ventriloquist in that one? We don't know. God's the ventriloquist. You're the dummy. And we just copy because we have no choice. God just basically has the world as his footstool, the world as his game, and we're all just part of this ventriloquist play that is performed called the world. And people think, well, if you become a Christian, that's God's world. He's so powerful. Where do we get any choices at all? Maybe you think that's the case, that God just makes things happen and you really don't have any choice at all. The only reason you imitate God is because he's in charge of everything. And what choices do you have? Hopefully you'll see that actually Ephesians 5, 1 to 2, especially that, means nothing of the sort. Let me pray first. And we'll actually spend a bit of time in that verse and in the one before it, in verse 32. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray that as we do come to your word, you may help us clearly understand what it means to imitate God so that our actions are wise rather than unwise and our worship is sincere rather than insincere. Help us, Lord, be filled with the Spirit rather than be filled with nonsense. Help us be filled with what leads to righteousness and wisdom. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. So how do we get away from thinking that imitation can be done just by copying without a change of heart? Like uh, Jay in the first example there. Well, if you read with me those verses from verse 32 from the end of chapter 4 through to verse uh, 2 of chapter 5, you'll see very clearly, I think, how the context sets up what real imitation is. Verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, God forgave you. In Christ, God forgave you. So basically, Paul establishes that our only way of actually being able to love one another is first understanding the love of God. I've said this before when we did 1 John, you can't give what you don't have, you can't copy what you don't know. But you can try hard, but it's not the same. So don't hear me ever say here, just try harder. It never works. Try harder only gets you into depression and guilt. The only way of actually 
applying what God has given to you is by first receiving it as your own individual experience. You can't forgive someone Christianly. You can forgive someone as the world forgives. I'm not saying you can't do that, and many thousands and millions and billions of people do. But you can't forgive as Christ forgave you unless you know the depth of forgiveness that you have been given by Christ. That's what verse 32 is all about. Be kind and compassionate, but not just any old kind and compassionate, like all of us who are non-Christians at one time live out the non-Christian life. You're kind and compassionate. But it's a type of kind and compassion that's defined by Jesus. It's a kind and compassion that sees in the other person someone worthy of being forgiven, just like you are. You're not worthy because you're good. You're worthy because you're one of God's creatures. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Not just why, but how. Just as Christ, in Christ, God forgave you. So that would be very hard to do if you have not felt the love of God yourself. So that's the most important thing. Now, unlike salvation, this is not a once-for-all thing. I've, I told you this story about a, a teacher I used to work with who said, I told my wife on our wedding day that I love her. I said, do I get back to her if it ever changes? It hasn't, so I've never had to say it since. How that woman put up with that bloke, if you listen, and uh, John, oh, i got no idea. Mary was a very faithful lady. Love is not static. It's dynamic, which means we need to grow in it. Not only do we need to grow in it, there's a knowledge of it that can diminish. Nobody on their wedding day, I suspect, anticipated divorce. But it changes. It can go up, it can go down, it can go backwards, it can turn into hate, it can turn into revenge and all sorts of evil things. And so it's dynamic. So how does this dynamism actually work? We'll continue reading. The, the Bible tells us, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly, large children, dearly loved children and walk in the way of love. It's not stand still. To walk is meaning to live, to grow, to be alongside. It's a dynamic thing. We must never think that we have everything we have from Jesus. I have received the forgiveness of Christ when I was a 10-year-old. I didn't personally, but some of you may have. And I don't need to worry about it anymore. Well, not quite true. Because forgiveness is an emotion, it's dynamic. Yes, God has forgiven you in Christ Jesus. And your salvation is paid for once for all. But you'll be involved in relationships of pain and suffering, joy and so on and so forth. And unless we have a mindset to grow in those relationships, to forgive one another, to grow in our understanding of Christ, then sadly, we may fall into that moralism type framework. Because in church, it can be far easier to copy religion, to copy ritual, than to embrace it. And we all feel that way, don't we, sometimes? You walk into church, you don't feel like being here, but you're here. Someone's dragged you along or you didn't want the minister or somebody else calling you because you're away and you're here and you go through the motions. We've all been that way. But if you are sustained that way, that's when it becomes a problem. Because love must be static. No, love is dynamic. Forgiveness is once for all in Christ Jesus, but our lives are never static. So how does this move on? Well, the key idea I hopefully can see in verses 32 to 52 is we need to grasp the dynamic love of God in a continual way in our life so that as we start to live out our life, we are able to come to different situations and make wise decisions. Now, the wise decision, here's my potential heresy for the day, and I'll try and backtrack out of it. The wise decision is not the behaviour you see here in verse 3 and following. That's the outcome of already wise decisions you made. The wise decision is not avoiding sexual, sexual immorality. Avoiding greed. Now, yes, that is wise, but the decision-making process is part of what makes it wise, the thinking process. Let me ask you this question and see how you go with it. I'm not going to focus, really, on all of these behaviours. What I want to focus on is why are they there? Why? Let me show you the part of the verse, and I'll ask you the question, why is this relevant? So, I'm not saying we're going to skip past all the behaviours, but look at the text at the end of verse 3. See the word because? So sexual immorality, pure, impurity, greed, and then underneath it, foolish talk, obscenity, coarse joking, are all out of place. Look at verse 3, right in the middle there. Because these are improper 
for God's holy people. Okay, are they? Why? Why are any of those things in verse 3 or following improper for God's holy, holy people? And the answer can't be, in this context I think, because God said so. Why does it then lead to verse 5? For this you can be sure, no immoral, impure or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, which means to substitute God as an object of worship and insert yourself or something else like materialism, sexuality and the like that are listed above. Okay? Well, why is verse 3b true? Secondly, why are you an idolater if you are immoral, impure or greedy? Why is that the case? Let's look at them in kind, in tow as we go. Because there are no, because there are improper for God's holy people. Why is that the case? I've said it enough times that hopefully some of you may have some answers rummaging through your minds. Why is it that God says, because these are improper for God's holy people? Overall, I think this forms part of the answer, not the in total answer. It'll take us a few weeks to do the total answer, but I think this is where it begins. I think in all of these examples here, whether it's sexual immorality, impurity, which is just a bigger concept for undignified way of seeing another person, whether it's greed, foolish talk, obscenity, all those listed there, and then the ones on the other page in verses 10 and onwards, I think God knows that it changes the way we see people if we engage in those things. It changes the way we interact with people. All of them come under that umbrella. What I mean by that is that a person who is sexually immoral doesn't wake up one day, for example, in a Christian country like Australia or Christianized country, because some of you may have had family and friends who have been married for 10, 30, 40 years. And they may have uh, slept around with three or four partners before they got married and have lived happy lives ever after. So how does that fit into here? Or does it? Well, I think what the text is saying is that as a whole, what God is saying to us in the initial part of this verse is hopefully clear. And you see this through the rest of the scriptures. That sin changes the way we see people fundamentally as different from God. We see them differently. So, for example, just as the extremes, it enables you with the first point of contact with sexuality to see a person as an object of pleasure, an object for your satisfaction, rather than a person to be mutually engaged with. And therefore, the importance of marriage in that context is that it becomes far harder to break the bond, not impossible because we live in a sinful world, we're all sinners, we all stuff things up. And that's why we need forgiveness and love and mercy. If it were not so, we'd all be in heaven with Jesus. But the basis of it is that God is saying that in marriage is the best and best way where you can look at the other person and not see them solely or individually as an object of your desire, as your pleasure. Now, I don't think you need to move very far before a bloke starts to think of a woman as an object of desire for their personal satisfaction and doesn't see them as a female in need of Christ's love. I don't think it takes very long for most blokes to get that direction. But that also works with the others, you see, with greed. That is, when you start to be a greedy person, what does that mean? You start to see your resources as yours. And so it changes the way you view another person. So if you're a boss, you start to think of a person as a product. This person, I've got a downsize, I've got to sack 10 people or five. You start to think about numbers. This person needs to be laid off. You start to think of people not as your neighbour. You start to think of your resources as yours as mine. It's my castle. You take care of your castle. If you can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps, that's your fault, not mine. I'm looking after my family and my people. You look after yours. You can't? Well, that's not my fault. You've had the same opportunities as me. That's because you've been an addict or done other things that are wrong. That's your fault. That's not the way God thinks you see. And so greed is actually mentioned more times than most other sins in the Bible. In fact, Jesus mentions it a lot. Greed. The the ability to see another person as a resource. The ability to see another person as something that could take away your resources. 
and it works with obscenity, foolish talk as well. When a person is engaged in absolute jocular talk, what are we doing? We're using other people for our entertainment, for our own mocking advances. You look at another person, not as God sees them, but as something that makes you feel better. That as, and Australia loves this. As we tear people down, we love them being torn down to our level. See, you're just like me, or even worse, you're below me. We're not seeing the person as they should be seen in God's eyes. And we know we've all been part of it. We laugh and we find things funny, and I've been a part of it too, where you use your wit to bring another person down, you use your intellect to show that you're superior to other people. That's got nothing to do with the scriptures. So I think firstly and foremost, all of these sins are in there because they involve you and me seeing other people not as how God sees them, as objects of desire, as products, as consumer goods like a person is, or sadly, for my entertainment purposes as I laugh at them or deride them or bring them down. Now, if that is true, then I think the next thing is also true. That the sad reality is that God knows it changes the way we see ourselves. It's almost impossible not to. We don't see ourselves in the way that God would see us. That I see myself as a person whose, whose desires need to be fulfilled. And I may hold you accountable for not fulfilling them. I may judge you accordingly. And so, sadly, we end up being all individuals who have something against one another because something in our side of us is not being fulfilled. Now try and go and live out verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Hard to forgive people, isn't it? When you see other people as somehow needing to fulfil your own desires. Whether it's a desire of love, a desire of intimacy, a desire of happiness, a desire to have more goods, and so your workers aren't working hard enough, so you've got to make them more productive, whatever the case might be. Sadly, very hard then to love one another. This is why verse 8 is so stark. If I get verse 8 to come up there, the next verse, thanks for us, Josh. Verse 8. He could have said this, and I don't know whether we would have picked up much difference initially. For you were once in darkness. But notice what he does say. Sounds pretty tough, doesn't it? Try this over your evening meal. For you were once darkness, not in darkness. He doesn't say you were in the dark, like somehow my own actions have parachuted myself into this world of evil. No, he says, when you describe the dark, you're it. What Calvin would call total depravity, a complete inability to relate to God. A complete inability to relate to God. For you were once darkness. I was quite old by the time I first of all got on a plane. I think uh, Catherine and I, when we went over to Perth, when I, 2000 it was, when the Olympics are on. We didn't stay for the Olympics, we went and visited uh, Catherine's family in, uh, over in Western Australia uh, during the Olympics time. First time on a plane, caught the red eye, I don't know if you ever caught the red eye to Perth. But when you get on, on the plane, I had a window seat and you, I spent the entire initial time just looking at all the lights. But pretty soon, you head out and what do you see? Just black, just darkness. But every now and then, you see a light. And you see an individual light and you see a little glimmer and it may be small, but then you might see a collection of lights. This is what this text means. It doesn't mean you survive yourself. You are a light, yes, individually true. But remember, it's collective. He's speaking to the Ephesian church. You are, read the verse with me, but now you are light in the Lord. So he's arguing, remember, for a complete transfer of identity. You were this, heading that direction, to hell in a handbasket, down a massive slippery dip, paved with honey and razor blades. You were heading there. But now, in Christ, he's picked you up this direction. Not the kingdom of Satan, remember, earlier in Ephesians, but the kingdom of God in the son he loves. So it's not that you were just having a bad day and God saved you from your own errors. You were darkness, you're like that in the plane, look out over Australia, in the middle of it, and you see absolutely nothing, just darkness. That's you. Evil to the core doesn't mean evil like some despot. 
It means an inability to do anything right in the face of God. That's what it means. But now you are in the light of the Lord. Well, let me just indulge you for one moment before we move on quickly and finish up. The Lord Jesus many times used the imagery of light for two reasons. So I think this is what light will mean in this context too. And then you'll see, hopefully in a moment, how it immediately leads on to wisdom. What is light? Well, many of you will have memorised at Sunday school and the like, John 3.16. But John 3.16 is not even the main verse in John 3. In fact, it's not the main verse in that paragraph. The text in John 3.16 moves along to what I think is one of the main verses of that text. And he gives it away. He says, this is the verdict. After... God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He goes on in a few verses and then said, this is the verdict. After all of that, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light. So there's going to be a world in which darkness and light coexist. And so what do you need to be? Well, you need to be that dot of light flying the red eye from Sydney to Perth. That when other people are in the darkness and they lift their head above the parapet and say, what's this life about? They see a light. Or to use another metaphor, you see the lighthouse and you know how to get there and you go there. But just in case we think that we become the pure people, we do. It doesn't mean you need to be perfect, but it does mean for the very first time we have the ability by the Holy Spirit to make wise decisions, to live according to God, to say no to those things. Why? Because when I see the woman, you see her as a sister in the Lord, remember. When I see another person who's blind and begging and poor, I see a person not who's trying to rob me, but a person in need of my care. If I have goods to share, you can share them because they're in the Lord as well. This is how we change the way we view things, not practising the behaviours, but seeing the reasons why the behaviours need to be practised at all. So the first thing that's critically important is that we see that Jesus himself is that light. Now, what does that light mean? The light symbolises the beaming of the Holy Spirit by the power of God. Now, I don't know how it happens, but I know when I see it, when it does happen, that God gives us a change of heart, the heart of stone ripped out and now we have this heart empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now what does that look like? Well, it looks like what we've just seen in chapter 4 verse 32, that as I have received the forgiveness of God, I can start to apply that. I said, Lord, I don't want to forgive that person. I don't like what that person's done. But I know that the bitterness is making me poisoned, not them. Help me deal with that. And God can help you. But I'm not pretending it's a quick process, but I'm pret- I know it is a process that God can do and is able to do. So the light of the Lord changes the way we think about ourselves and then will help us live those lives out with other people. The second thing that light does is in our text here, as you can see. Let me continue reading, dropping ourselves down to verse 11. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. So this type of imagery is more like the torch or like if the lighthouse was beaming, showing the boat the way, as the boat gets closer, you may see, if you're the person in the lighthouse, some of the behaviour of the people on the boat and maybe they're not so happy. So you are able to expose the truth because you don't live by the darkness. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that that will be taken very nicely by people. But it doesn't mean also that you give up. Now, I'm going to almost end our time together with a bit of a mixed metaphor, as it does in our text here. You can see there it says, For the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness and truth. I want to say, this is you. Anyone know what this fruit is? Lychee. I love lychees. Anyone love lychees? I love them. When we lived in Indonesia, they were a bit bigger and a bit full on the flesh. Was oh, I'm back there now as we speak. Beautiful. I still love these ones. I sent Catherine to find them yesterday. I was tracking down these lychees on 
uh, woolworths.com.au. Where are these lychees? We found them. I love lychees. Now, this is a Christian, a lychee. Now, if I rub this like this, if I kept doing it, I'd probably um, give myself a bit of a rash and abrasion. It's pretty, they're pretty coarse and tough on the outside. That's you, brothers and sisters. You need to be coarse and tough on the outside. Why? Because some of you will expose the falsehood of your family and friends and they'll treat you like rubbish. They'll hate you. They'll curse you. And you're more likely to be soft as next time if you're not tough on the outside. Also knowing the truth that you speak is the truth in tow. But being tough doesn't mean being tough on the inside. You know what a lychee looks like on the inside? It looks delicious. That's what it looks like. It looks delicious. Now, if you're tough on the inside, I think you're more likely just to end up being a moral wowser. If you're tough on the inside and tough on the outside. I've been hurt in the past. I've told this person the truth. They wouldn't have a bar of it. And I'm not going to talk to them again. Just tough on the outside. Or when you tell people they've done the wrong thing, you say it in such a way that they don't like you at all. So you need to be soft and sweet on the inside. Soft and sweet. Tough on the outside, soft and sweet on the inside. Why? Because Christ Jesus, he was tough. But he was humble, gentle, kind, compassionate, loving, and forgave others. Those those words in Ephesians 4.32 to 5.1. That's Christ, isn't it? Kind, compassionate, forgiving, loving. Now he says, walk in the way of love. Being tough on the outside, but sweet, kind, gentle on the inside. But you know what a bad light she is? One that has either really no flesh at all, and the other one is where the seed takes up everything. Oh, I don't like that either. Not enough flesh. But in the middle, you've got to have a core. And that's to mix my metaphors once again. The seed is this foundation of our faith, as it says many times in the New Testament. This seed is strong. But if I plant one seed, you don't get a harvest. What you do need to have is what it says at the end of our text in verses 19 and following. Instead, be filled by the Spirit. Who? You all. Together, being mutually encouraged. When we're struggling together, then we can move on together. When we struggle individually, that's when we get exposed, that's when we give up, that's when we fail, that's when we struggle long term. So be the lychee. That is, you've got to be tough on the outside because if you expose falsehood, expect persecution, expect people not to treat you well. But if you expose them with love, because in your heart is a sweetness that sees them want to know the compassion that you feel. But remember early in Ephesians, from Ephesians 1 to 3, it focused on this, didn't it? The seed. Make sure you get the foundation right. You plant the wrong stuff, the fruitless deeds of darkness will only reap fruitless deeds of darkness. The fruit of the Spirit is what Ephesians 1 to 3 was talking about. Saved by Jesus Christ. The word that he preaches is truth. Hold firm to that. How do you know you've held firm to that? Because over time you become sweeter to the Lord. Or as it will say when we do with Leviticus, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Or as it says here in our text, in verse 2, walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So stick to your guns. Stick firm to the word of God, but don't stick so firm that the tough exterior of your faith becomes the tough interior of your heart. How do you be wise? Well, a wise person is just that, a lychee. Always knew lychees were awesome. <laughs> firm on the outside, firm about their faith, with a rock core centre, but a sweet heart that has the other person's spiritual needs at the forefront of their minds, but never so sweet that they buckle and change the word of God, stick to the foundation, Never so sweet that you become so soft that you have no hard skin and you give up before you start. They all come true together. A wise person is a lychee. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you great thanks that we're all lychees. No. I give you great thanks, Heavenly Father, for the love that you've shown to us in Jesus Christ. Firstly, Lord, I do pray for each one of us here especially for those who 
do not know of the forgiving love of Jesus Christ that today, for the very first time, they may see God's love displayed in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, for us here as well, who have known of your saving love, know of your grace, help us never take it for granted. Love is dynamic, not static. So as we go through our life, Lord, in grief, in tears, in joys, Help us at each part of that compass bring our lives before you and ask for your help, ask for your strength, ask for your sustenance. To be wise is to know the love of God. Heavenly Father, each one of us no doubt have made lots of unwise decisions. We thank you for your forgiveness and by your grace, Lord, help us to see one another not as instruments of pleasure but as brothers and sisters in the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.